What is crack a fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Valley, joined by Matt Moderno of the Believe in Wizards podcast. Please follow him on Twitter. He's a great, great follow at Matt Moderno. That's at M O D D E R N O for his last name. Matt spelled with two T's, exactly as it sounds. Does a great job covering the Wizards, like I said, as the Believe in Wizards podcast host. Uh, The Wizards are making news in the playoffs, which is uncomfortable for everyone because they're not really in the postseason um, as as right on schedule. If you were watching them the past few years. Um, So I brought Matt on. He's not kind enough to come on on short notice to discuss just the Wizards outlook, the future, what happens in the aftermath of Tommy Shepard being, quote, unquote, dismissed. Wasn't a parting of the ways like we normally hear. He was he was dismissed. Uh, Our biggest question, though, Matt, how are you doing? I'm great. Like I'm happier than I should be that someone lost their job and now has to find another way to feed their dozen tri- like children. But um, yeah, sorry, I feel bad. But like we just needed something fresh here and start fresh and been waiting a long time for this. I always grapple with that in what we do because you're constantly calling for not constantly, but part of the the job, the shtick is talking about when people need to be fired. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the way to rationalize it, but when they're making as much money as they do, when you know they're as well connected as they are and that these jobs technically lead to other ones, it's just a little bit different. And I would never root for someone to lose their job, but it's just, it's the nature of the beast. And it's different than if average Joe or Janet ends up getting fucked in the real world. It's just like, this is a game and you're getting paid handsomely to deal with the instability that is inherent of, not just running a team, but playing for a team if you're a player and, and so on and so forth. This guy kept the job. He was largely mediocre at for over 20 years. So, uh, like, again, I don't have a ton of sympathy at this point, and I'm sure he'll get another job. He He's like a genuinely nice guy and a well-liked guy. So someone will find a room, a home for him somewhere. And to be honest with you, I thought it was honestly more likely he would get promoted than fired. So yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that he won't come back with the Wizards in, in some capacity down the road here. So, well, the other thing, I didn't realize he, you had mentioned this on your podcast that you recorded immediately in the aftermath of, uh, and I'm just going to keep saying dismissed because it just felt sure. like such a stern word. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize he had like 13 kids or whatever it was. I knew he was from like a farmer, like a big farmer or something like that. Um, but I did not know he had that many children. Every time I say it, there's going to be more kids. So eventually he'll have just like his own basketball team running around at home. I, I don't remember what the exact number is, but uh, the, the man's been doing work. I don't know what else to say. Well, let's start with this before we get into the implications of it. And if I, we're not, I'm not going to pester you too much about his track record, though. Please feel free to mention about why he is where he is. You did a great job of uh, covering that with your guest. Um, was it Osman Bay? I can't remember his name. I apologize. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so go check out that podcast again. Believe in Wizards. But were you surprised at all that this happened, or did based off some of the things that Shepard said um, at the end of the season, even the letter he whatever it was released to fans? Did you see this writing on the wall a little bit? Uh, honestly, I, I was totally floored by by the decision. The Wizards don't usually do things that surprise me, and, and in this case, pleasantly surprise me. I talked to somebody that had been uh, in the organization longer than Tommy had immediately after the move, and, and they were equally surprised just because he was so well-liked and, and so well-entrenched in the kind of fabric of the organization. This has been sort of a mom and pop, you know, like local community-run organization for so long, and they typically don't move on from people quickly and not that 20 plus years is quick but they also don't move on from people with years left on their contracts very often and and that's by all accounts you know what tommy had left it's always a little vague you know how much time he had and and that sort of thing but uh everyone was under the assumption that that he would be here for another like two years at a minimum so yeah definitely surprised Uh, i think within the halls of the building they were surprised and the wording was what was kind of most surprising to me this guy that that is well liked and that you didn't seem to have a problem with a week ago is dismissed i I know you like that word i was very shocked by that wording too and they kind of pointed to the lack of playoff success and and fans uh unhappiness with it over the last two seasons so if you've got an owner that says you know we will never ever tank and you were basically in a position where you had to tank down the stretch i don't know if that was too big of an ego hit for him to overlook or what but it was a little surprising um just just because of that yeah, I, the, I can't get over the wording. I found it borderline hysterical. It was just like, did, did he watch like Rui Hachimura in game one against the Grizzlies? Like, fuck this. Like, it's time for a change or something. Wait, didn't we have him? Right. Uh, and what did we get from Kendrick Nunn in second round picks? Is that awesome? Yeah. 
it's got to uh, be something to do with it, right? Just just how bad you look to the rest of the league and the fan base if if that guy goes off. And if he points to how fans were disappointed that the Wizards missed the playoffs, and my read on most Wizards fans anyway, uh, there are some, and kudos to them, but they've come up with ways to defend the Wizards, which is just, <laughs> it's honestly impressive at this point. But uh, it, my read on the fan base is they're more mad that they Washington has strived to remain on the treadmill of sub mediocrity than how these seasons have ended, that they might be more angry that the expectation was that this team could make the playoffs playoffs or worse that the expectation or the, the goal is to actively just be in that like 41 to 44 win territory first round exit type of team. They're at the ultimate like fork in the road basketball wise, like be bad or go all in to be good. And they're trying to like go this unbeaten path down the middle with this like middle build is the term we keep hearing. And, and that is a directive from Ted Leonsis. So I looked at this a little bit as they told Tommy, this is your direction. You have to build a successful air quote successful. Who knows what success criteria is for them, but a playoff team with this approach and no one else is really good enough to do this. So uh, we're going to hold you to this impossible standard. And and he wasn't succeeding in the path that they wanted to go down. And it seems like he he kind of paid the price for that. But yeah, Wizards fans would have either loved, hey, we're going to do something crazy and try to make the six seed here and at least make the playoffs and be be a real playoff team or blow this thing up completely and get everybody out of here and start fresh with a clean deck. And they'll just never do that. Like, I mean, maybe maybe a new big time GM will come in and convince Ted that this approach does not work. But I would be very shocked if that's the case, personally. One thing that was encouraging is that the executive search, they he made it a point. Leonce has made a point to say it's going to be someone from outside the organization, which would be the first time since 2003. They had someone running their front office from out brought them into outside the organization. Is that actually encouraging or do we kind of point to his wording in the statement about Tommy Shepard where he's so disappointed that they didn't make the playoffs as oh and and also this and I'm not saying he necessarily should be fired but saying that the coach is attached to this team is always a great way to start off a new relationship with the head of front office is th- is this going to be more of the same I saw immediate Bradley Beal trade talk would he ask her out would they look to move him to me, it feels like it's going to be more of the same, but it, I'm like 8 million miles away from this. So what is your impression of the way that this search is going to unfold? Is it going to be to look for someone who can kind of just like, oh, can you continue the middle build, essentially? I think almost anybody that takes this job is going to go into it with the understanding that Ted wants to be a playoff team next year. And he will see, you know, losing these guys in free agency, trading mm-hmm. away Beal as as a failure or inability to do that or like a way to compromise their playoff chances for next year so i think they're going to go on business as usual their first order of business for the new gm will be bring both of those guys back make bradley beal happy the only way that beal is not here in the future is if bradley beal says i don't want to be here in the future like that that's the only thing that changes this um Mm -hmm. and I mean, if I'm Brad at this point, I haven't shown anything that says I'm going to want out of here. And and Brad had some interesting comments at the end of the season about voicing his frustration to the appropriate people and clarifying to media who apparently had it twisted that Brad is not actually the GM of the team and they should talk to Tommy and Ted with respect to why the team isn't winning more. So I do kind of wonder if maybe Brad went to Ted and said, hey, this is not working. I offered to show you some patience and I'm so gracious and I, I haven't been rewarded for that with a playoff team around me. I, I don't know, but I think Ted is committed to Brad. And uh, I think the new GM is going to have to be okay with that. The only way that changes is if maybe you can convince, you know, one of these big time GMs to come in here and they have just enough cachet and track record to convince Ted that like this does not work. You cannot do it this way. Otherwise, I, I just don't see them pivoting from something they've been trying to do for, for a very long time. Like this was the... Tr- the path under Ernie too. Like they were just better at it because they had, you know, a a player in John wall that made other guys around them slightly better, but it was mostly just, Hey, how do we trade a first round pick for another fringe starter to help us make the eight seed again? Like this is, this isn't new. And I don't expect, you know, I don't see a reason to expect it to change personally. What have been your impressions of Wes Unsell Jr. Through his first, couple seasons is it tough to evaluate him given some of the roster churn that he had and then just the level of talent and then what do you sort of make 
it felt like if you read through some of the comments that Shepard made this year, it kind of felt like he put the onus of the underachieving on coaching and, and injuries, of course, because they're mm-hmm. the only team to leave that dealt with injuries, quite frankly. Uh, he put the onus on those things rather than necessarily anything transactional that he had spearheaded. Yeah, somehow we're like still blaming COVID for the fact that we're not a good team. And to be fair, Brad <laughs> Beal has had COVID like 11 times more than the average person. So so maybe there is some truth to that. But he did. Bradley Beal quiet. No one really talks about it. Like he was good this season too when he played. So the, 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 the when he played is the huge yeah. end to that sentence. And and if you'd gotten 65 games of Brad, uh, then then maybe this looks a little different. Right, so that's that's sort of the big piece of this too is just that Brad was the least healthy of the two between him and Porzingis is, is kind of not what I would have expected going into the season. But uh, yeah, it's just the whole situation with this is, is just sort of weird. And I, I think Tommy was fine in the vacuum. Wes is probably fine in the vacuum. I think the real problem is just like accountability from the top down. It's always somebody else's fault and the players see that and they even sort of go to that approach as well. You saw Monte Morris, who was by all accounts, you know, uh, Wes Unseld's chosen son from Denver saying that like, yeah, we told them from day one that this team needed to play a lot faster. And you saw we were better when we played faster. We don't know why the coaches didn't let us play faster. So you've got Corey Kisper talking about the lack of accountability in the locker room and, and things like that. To me, that all sounds like coaching stuff. And then you have Wes and his people kind of advocating that, no, 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 this is a personnel thing. Like I can't do what I want to do because these guys aren't getting it. And that's where the comments you mentioned about Shepard saying it's really easy for the coach to say that these guys aren't listening. You have to make them listen basically. So I think the fault is kind of is all around. I- I'm sure that Wes, like if he were in a nicely structured organization with some like strong culture in place, he could be a perfectly fine X's and O's guy. And, you know, maybe you have a strong enough veteran that that gets people to buy in around him, but that doesn't seem like it's happening here. I personally, that's where I would have moved on from someone. I actually just haven't seen anything super inspiring from him. But we talked about this a little bit on our pod, just sort of the notion of can this team really afford to clean house on both the front office and the coaching staff in the same summer with such a huge draft pick coming up and things like that? Maybe it's better to give him one opportunity here And maybe you can supplement his coaching staff with sort of like, you know, basically put his replacement next to him and just give him a chance to coach for his job and, and see how it works. We've seen teams put pressure on their head coach by, by putting a strong assistant next to them. And, you know, I don't know if that's an option or not. I feel like those situations never end well for the incumbent head coach. Agreed, but it might end well for us as Wizards fans. I don't know. I, to me, it would just be a matter of delaying the inevitable. And if that's how you feel as an organization about Wes Unsell Jr., then you should move on from Wes. On, like, why Why delay the – especially because whether your goal is to middle build or actually get better from here, like Bradley Beal's not super young anymore. Like, you're on his timeline. You don't just have years to punt away and experiment yeah. with. Is there – we both agree that they're just not going to – I would be floored. Uh, although, I guess if they – would they be more likely to consider a more gradual course if they jump up in the lottery? They go from – they lost the coin toss, so they're eighth or whatever it is, and they Correct. jump into the top four, would that make them more likely to rebuild, or would they be more likely to shop the the fuck out of that pick? This is an organization that traded the fifth pick in the Steph Curry draft for Mike Miller and Randy Foy, so you can never fully rule that out. Uh, now, that was the previous owner's directive to see a winning team before he died, as uh, morbid as that sounds. So, you know, there, there's something to that, and maybe they wouldn't do that under normal circumstances, but it's got to be a question they ask, right? Like we've seen that with Portland saying that they're going to trade the pick unless it's like the first pick. Uh, that might've been something on Tommy Shepard's radar. I hope no competent GM that comes in to replace him thinks that that's a sound strategy. And as much as you get ownership directive, you can also go back to them and say like, look, there's not a deal here. So I hope that they would uh, communicate that to ownership, that there's no solid deal here where you trade Amon Thompson for, I don't know, somebody, it just right, Van Fleet sign and trade or something. Yeah, something exactly. Like, like the salaries going out have to make sense too. And, and there's just not a lot of flexibility for them. You know, I guess we can talk a little bit about what they resign these guys for here in a minute, but there's also just like not a lot of trade assets on this team. You're limited to one pick you can trade essentially. And does anyone really want Daniel Gafford that bad that he's like a huge trade chip? Is Corey Kispert like somebody that teams are like falling over each other to try to line up and get? It's just, 
how much like bigger of a, a get are you going to go out? Are you adding a fourth star to your big three to have a huge four? I, I don't know. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's, it's rough. I, I think you have to hope that this pick is somebody that can come in and, and fit with the pieces around you and, and move the needle, at least if not exactly this year, maybe for next year. I think it'll be, it should be fairly easy in theory to determine what direction the wizards are headed based off who they hire to replace mm -hmm. Shepard. But is there another sort of flash bulb decision that will clue you in on, even if it's not, you know, we know, we know it's not going to be rebuilding. I don't know why I'm trying to dance around it, but is it Kyle Kuzma's contract? The, the, the seriousness of KP extension talks, another player that they might chop on the roster players. They're linked to, to the draft that will clue you in. Are you just looking at one decision that will clue you in on what this franchise is actually hoping or trying to accomplish before the start of next season? I think just the nature of both of those contract extensions will tell us a lot about these things. Like we had heard as a fan base that, you know, it's sort of been subtly reported that the front office offered Bradley Beal, the no trade clause and things like that, that they were not negotiating tactics that they came to the table and said, here are all the things we can give you. Here you go. So uh, it, it just the shrewdness of their negotiating with people like Porzingis. Like if if the deal is four years, 120 million, but there's a team option and it's incentive based on how many games he's able to play and does he make an all star team and things like that, and they're not willing to just totally give him the farm, then you know maybe that says uh, that like. Yeah, we want you back, but we're not willing to be stupid to do it. Hey, right. Kyle Kuzma, we'd love to have you, but uh, $33 million a year is just not going to work for us, and we don't think you're going to get that in the open market. So if you want to explore that first and come back to us, fine. Like I think that says a lot about, you know, hey, we like these guys. We want to keep building this approach, but we're not going to appear desperate to do it. And and that's sort of – they've wreaked a little of desperation for the last – I don't know, 25 years. So, so this would be a, a change in um, approach, I think. And let's get into some of that. And look, I want to ask you about Corey Kispert runners and Xavier Cooks's future with the organization, but that's uh, what, if you're kind enough to come back on for our regular season, look ahead, those are questions pertaining to that. We have to get to the, the transactional nature of this off season. And so let's start with Perzingis who had, uh, it's not a season. And this, I don't mean this as an intel. It's not a season that flew under the radar. I think everyone kind of understood how good he was mm -hmm. all year. And his availability was up there. I've personally, from what I saw of him, I haven't seen him move that well yeah. defensively since he was in New York. Yeah. Um, but there's also the, when you're talking about his next contract, so I'm curious as to what your number would be. His max is 40.2 million, which is basically close to what his player option is for. Yeah, uh, it's 37 with, for the player yeah. option. Yeah. Um, but like some of the stuff, the efficiency from beyond the arc off the catch, I think that can easily translate. He takes some tough shots and they were going in this year, 47% on fadeaways. I think I've mentioned this on a, on our podcast before. Uh, he shot 60% on post-ups, which among everyone who had a hundred post-ups this year, only Jokic had better efficiency in the post. I just don't know if you can scale that ahead to future seasons and count on that. So that coupled with his availability, but also coupled with, how fucking awesome he was this season. Like what is your, as an organization, like what's your preferred or even walk away or like, this is as high of a number in as many years as I'm going for, for KP. I think the subtle rumblings here that he and his people know that he's either taking big upfront money or longer term sort of financial security. And hopefully they're on the same page about what that really means. If, if, I, honestly, I think like four for 120 is like kind of where I'm at with this. Like if you start somewhere around that general number and, oh, it ends up being a million and a half more per year than that, like like so be it. But I don't have any kind of reasonable comps prepared to say like this is the exact number it has to be. And honestly, I think he's a hard person to come up with a comp for because guys that play as well as he played this year aren't free agents like that often, I feel like. And they also don't typically come with the injury track record that he did. I agree with you about the movement. He talked a lot about like losing the weight he bulked up with in Dallas and, and doing a lot of Pilates and yoga and working on flexibility and mobility. And I thought that really like made sense and seemed to that helped to Miles Turner a lot. Sorry to interrupt you too, but like no. they, he talked a lot about his hip movement after he mm -hmm. had started doing stuff along those lines. And so maybe, and to your point, by the way, there's, if you really think about it, I think they're in a class of their own in terms of proven track record. There's Miles Turner, Miles Turner, Brooke Lopez, and Kristaps Porzingis is sort of those actual mm -hmm. floor spacing, rim protecting bigs that anyone's chasing. And after that, it's 
unless I'm missing someone. I mean, maybe you throw Nas Reed or sure. you know that's Zeke Naji into that a little bit, but they're not like in the same tier. And so like mm-hmm. that's what to me makes Porzingis even tougher to define. You talked about sort of is this like something we can expect from him next year in terms of some of these efficiency things and be honest with you, I don't even actually think he was that well utilized this year personally. Like for anybody that's watching Wizards games, they would know he would go supernova in the first quarter and then not touch the ball again for the next two quarters. And they never ran like Bradley Beal, Chris Tapps, Porzingis pick and roll to end games. He just kind of stood there and hoped he got a look, which is an insane misuse of your tools at your disposal, in my opinion. But I think there's a lot of stuff they could do to get him like better looks even. So maybe he can't make all the same tough stuff or he's not going to like hit post-ups at the insane rate he did this year. Cause that's not what the track record, you know, seems to indicate. But, but if you were like smarter about this and then again, that's maybe the sole reason why I would have gone a different direction coaching wise, or I'd, I'd ask, you know, an offensive coordinator to come in, in here and find some creative ways to use him. But, but there's some stuff you could do there to kind of mitigate any drop off in terms of just like, Maybe if some of those things were like a little lucky this year, at least that's where I'm at with it. I will say what I was pleased with by them, and this is nothing related to his value, is that post ups were like less than 18 percent of his offensive possessions, which was his lowest in years. And I think that's it's nice to have that tool in the chest, but those are not. I don't want my bread and butter on offense. And we, I think we saw even the Mavericks, maybe in part because Porzingis wanted that. That might show growth to him as a player that he is willing to be used in different ways or navigated this season where you said he was deployed inconsistently. Mm-hmm there there's like a sweet spot of that right like i i'm okay with that total number and i want it to be on the lower end but there were also certain times where like i'm thinking of these two heat matchups specifically where jamal kane which i don't even honestly know who that is and i watch a lot of basketball (laughs) was guarding chris tapps porzingis and there was like a a nine inch height difference and we had porzingis uh, like 17 feet from the hoop shooting fadeaways over him and it, it was just like okay i will bang my face into the table now if he fades over this guy again. So again, they're just like certain situations where like that, like that's the best we could do with Chris Tapps. And I'm, I'm not saying like you want 40% of his shots to be post-ups, but situationally you got to make teams pay for putting Fred Van Fleet on Porzingis, uh, you know, in the final five minutes of a basketball game. Your evaluation of him, I think is kind of spot on. And I don't think it will give anyone sticker shock, but even if it does, I think we're and I'll, I'll include myself in this. We're not all, yet caught up to looking at contracts against the new salary yeah. cap and tw- yeah. you, your number is like 21 22 percent of the projected salary cap and it might go it's going to go up from there and it might even go up from the the 134 million projection i think that's a fine commitment for me personally if i'm going higher in dollars but if more importantly if i'm going out more than two years there needs to be like some sort of back end protection against yeah, team like, options if you get hurt or something. Yeah, yeah the, for just because of his track record. And yeah. I think they should have the leverage to include some of that language, I would think, yeah. just because who is the team that is coming in and leveraging you into this huge offer? You look at the cap space teams, Orlando doesn't need them. And that's assuming they decide to use cap space. The Pacers don't need them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Spurs, like, he doesn't really fit with their timeline, although in theory, I guess they could use him and so like you start to go through the cap space teams and it's just like even if detroit uses cap space they have 80 centers still so it's not going to be it's not going to be them and so there's always sign and trade scenarios of course that can come on but the absence of this clear Kristaps porzingis suitor at the moment i think should help the wizards i would assume in negotiations to where no you're not going to get him for a cut rate but like let's not go and screw ourselves here like you arguably did in the Bradley Beal, as you described it, non-negotiation. The Wizards under Tommy Shepard would be, as the kids say, seemingly thirsty a lot of these times. Like it's, uh, <laughs> you know, like we we want Chris Dabbs back so bad. And he actually, he doesn't get why free agents don't want to come here. It's, yeah, because they, they literally, you know, get your ass as much as they can. So it'll say a lot about this new GM is how he handles that. Like if he negotiates from that position of strength, understands that he does have leverage, I think that sets the tone for how this organization moves over the next four or five, six years, whatever that looks like. And that's just sort of the number I came up with. Again, I I don't know if that's rational or realistic. I'm with you that you got to build some protections in there. I I do have like a little bit of PTSD as a Wizards fan with this sort of um, incentives based on games played because that happened with Spencer Dinwiddie and he, by all accounts, played hurt to try to get to that number that got him those incentives. So 
you know, that there's, there's some, it's tough. Like, you know, how, like, will the guy do what's best for the team if his, his salary is on the line? So you, you got to navigate that the right way. And hopefully that they're fair and reasonable. We've heard some stuff about Porzingis and his, his team and his brother and all these people maybe being tough to deal with. So I don't know what that'll look like um, in a negotiation, but we just can't operate as a desperate team anymore. And if he doesn't like what we're willing to spend, then, then so be it. We'll sign and trade you somewhere and we'll, we'll start new and Daniel Gafford's the center next year. Speaking of Daniel Gaffer, this is definitely more of a later in the summer after the roster set question, but I am curious, what did you think of the Porzingis Daniel Gafford front court that was being rolled out there for a huge chunk of this season? I think there were a lot of times where they had to do it out of necessity just because of the like flawed roster balance here. I, I don't like it personally. I think it's hard enough to win with one drop coverage big in the NBA, let alone two of them playing next to each other for 20 minutes a game. But it's just, they did what it was supposed to do. It deterred teams from kind of taking the ball into the paint against them. Teams actually shot a pretty good percentage against the two of them out there at the rim yeah. against with those two on the court. They just didn't get there as you put the, it out, which is yeah, it, exactly. Like you've, you've deterred them, but once they got there, they had a pretty easy time of scoring on, on both of you because neither of them are like the strongest, most physical guys. And Gafford's always like kind of falling down and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it, it just it, it speaks to the sort of the team that Tommy Shepard built. And as much as he wants to call that out and, and like, let's knock West for doing it. But there is a sort of like a, a thing in basketball where sometimes you have to put the five best guys you have on the court together and, and do your best to make it work. And I think there were definitely situations where the porous perimeter defense forced them to try to have this like bigger back line. And now you've got Porzingis, who just isn't a very good rebounder and not that Gafford's like the best rebounder. So it was basically rebounding by committee and you hope Porzingis can get 10 a game. You hope Denny can get eight a game. You hope DeLon Wright can get three or four and just, you can kind of mitigate that as a team. And, and that's sort of where I think they, they were trying to go with that. But if I'm a competent general manager, I'm going into next season with a, making it a priority to not have that be my starting front court. If, if I can, I mean, Dan, you watch more of the overall NBA than I do. Do you see any other teams playing two drop bigs together? Like, Maybe Cleveland, you could kind of say that, but they're both more switchable than both of our guys, I think. Yeah, Mobley's like basically defending at the point of attack. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's sort of the Detroit scenario where they were talking about the too, too big yeah. model, but it was like, well, you need like at least one of those bigs to be super versatile on defense, and you don't, right. you don't really have that. Uh, and I'm with you. I was surprised at how well they fared offensively, but when mm -hmm. I was digging deeper before the like sending you the outline – they got some absurd shot making from the yeah. lineups that they shot like 57% on log mid range jumpers, and then 44% from three. And that's, they're not propping up those numbers and the defensive returns were just not, yeah. Okay. Teams didn't get to the rim, but they shot mm -hmm. well once they got there, as you mentioned. So I think the goal would need to be like, Hey, that that's breaking case of emergency. You want to try it a little bit against certain teams. Sure. Go ahead. But mm -hmm. as sort of this crutch, I'm, I'm glad that you don't buy it because I just, I, I don't see it. Which means they'll double down on it just because we both <laughs> said that and it makes too much sense. Kyle Kuzma's free agency. He has the $13 million player option. He's going to decline it. It's arguably, it's more interesting, but then also tougher because I think he's just going to be the, the player with more suitors. And I don't have, the, the Porzingis question I had my own answer to, I don't have an answer to this same question for Kyle Kuzma, which is why I wanted to ask you it. I think he's made strides as a, a driver, playmaker since he's been in Washington, but the plug and play aspect of his game like he can still cut, but that's not really how they use him. Um, the spot up shooting was not good this year. Mm -hmm. And so I do wonder if on other teams, could he theoretically be harder to plug in if he's not going to have the same offensive agency that he had in Washington this season. And so I'm all over the place with him. What is knowing what he brings to the roster as currently constructed? What is your sort of, again, max number for, for Kyle Kuzma? I think he has more value to the Wizards than he does probably anywhere else he's going to go, just based on the multiple holes they try to use him to fill. Now, I, I do think what you do with him really is dictated on, do you think if you make other moves to the roster, you can mitigate some of those deficiencies for him? Like, we talk a lot about our podcast about, uh, it's a pro Kyle Kuzma podcast, because I, I just like that mold of player, but if you have a real point guard that gets him a few easy looks, like he's the guy that always catches the grenade for the team and he has to take the tough shots because a lot of times he's out there with a core of guys that, that really can't generate their own offense. And, and Monte Morris, he had this great assist to turnover ratio and things like that, but 
he's not creating like a lot of easy looks for anybody, especially Kyle Kuzma. So if you know going into it, like he's going to have to handle the ball and distribute as your 6'10 power forward, you're relying on him for a lot of things that I don't think he's he's super well suited to do um, as at the usage rate they asked him to do it. Now, you could have a long convo with him of how he sees himself. Is he think he's Giannis moving forward and he needs to have like the ball 30% of the time and he actually wants more usage? Or does he agree that, hey, if he could be a little more catch and shoot or you know, get downhill a little bit more because uh, somebody's like create a few looks for him and you have the spacing for him to cut and find seams and, and things like that. So it's just, there's still a lot of like unanswered questions about what you're going to do around him. And I think that dictates what his long-term future really should look like here at the very least. Uh, To me, like I, I think that mold of player is so important to successful teams, a guy that can play three through even five for some mm-hmm. cases The He's an elite defensive rebounder by all accounts. I think he's like 92nd percentile for power forwards or forwards in the NBA for defensive rebounding. And and you need those kinds of things next to Porzingis. And I think that's underrated. There were a lot of times he deployed, they deployed him as their stopper defensively. Like we talk a lot about Denny's defense and he's very good, but like when they're matched up with the Blazers and you're putting Kyle Kuzma as your first option to stop Dame Lillard, like one that says a lot about you not having a very balanced roster, but Dude, like you can't really replace that with anyone else here. So like I buy him, but again, there's this sort of that breaking point. And I don't have like a great number for you here too, but I would start with somewhere around that number. I talked about with Porzingis. Like, is it is four for 30, the number, are there a lot of incentives that you build in there for him? If you, if you're worried about efficiency, like, Hey, if you're this efficient, we can give you some more stuff. Like, I don't know how much that's realistic or not, but he's going to have a lot of offers. And I would just kind of like, firmly come in with, Hey, we think this is a really fair offer. We don't want to negotiate back and forth with you a lot. If you like it here, you want to stay here, take this, but we're not going to get into a bidding war with Portland or whatever for your services. And I I, I think 30 is probably the number we're talking about at this point. And I don't know if that's, if you can build a winning team around giving $30 million to a guy that was that inefficient as much as I, I like him personally. Having Kuzma, Porzingis, and Bradley Beal on the books for thirty plus million dollars next year would be wild. Just in just that'd be like yeah. the most that'd be the oddest like thirty plus million dollar trio in the league by far. For no no all stars among the three of them, which is crazy. Is and would you agree? I guess that Kuzma by default is almost a bigger flight risk than compared to Porzingis. Yeah, I just think there's more teams that in, can envision him fitting in because of that versatility. Like Porzingis is one thing; he is a big you know, a shooting specialist essentially that, that protects the rim for you somewhat. And Kuzma can be a three. He can be a four. He could be a small ball five. If you need him to, he can be your de facto backup point guard. Like that malleability, I think um, gives him more places to land potentially. The last singular player I have a question about is Denny Avdia. Uh, is he, I did, I demanded you say one to seven nice things about him in the actual outline, but, and I will do a victory lap every time he, someone bounces off him on a physical drive or if he takes more than three point three three point attempts in a game but is he more likely at this stage it's impossible i'm asking you an impossible question because you don't know who's gonna be running the front office would you view him as more likely to be extended or traded this offseason knowing the typical wizards meld would be they just keep him he goes into restricted free agency and they pay him well i guess they didn't do that with Rui, so i shouldn't say the typical wizards thing the Wizards have not extended a first round draft pick outside the top three since before I was born. I'm pretty sure is the statistic. So uh, that they just, they haven't hit on enough of those picks that weren't like no brainer picks to, to want to bring them back, which is crazy. It might honestly be like Jeff Malone was like the last guy that they drafted outside the top five that, that they brought in for a second contract. So I think this is one of the situations where it's, it is more likely that, he is extended then traded. I think it is less likely he's extended under the new person than it was under Tommy. I think if you're Tommy, you can't afford to say I had to ship Rui out of town and now I'm going to have to do that again with Denny just from an optics perspective. So I think that was almost like a done deal that they were going to make something happen this off season. Uh, I have heard anecdotally that, that Denny's people are, are looking at a pretty, um, hefty number for him in the off season here. And, and we'll see, what that number really uh, ends up looking like for him and, and uh, how on in sync it is with whatever the new GM looks like. But for me, I, I would keep him because I, I think 
he he does a lot of different things for you that maybe uh, you can unlock with a more again sort of evenly put together roster and uh, you can play to his strengths a little bit better. I don't know if this coach is well suited to do it. We've heard some rumblings that maybe he and Wes Unsell Jr. don't see perfectly eye to eye on his utilization. So I don't know. Maybe he's ready for somewhere else and thinks he can do more if somebody kind of you know, takes the handcuffs off him a little bit. But Six, nine guys that are good defenders that like to move the ball and aren't hunting shots all the time uh, aren't aren't super common to find. I, I do think he does have to get better at certain things on the offensive end. That's always where my sort of, I don't know if criticism is the right word, but like question marks come with him. How good can he be is solely determined to me by can he make defenses pay? Like there was a large portion of the year where teams were putting a center on him and just like totally leaving him open and just, they're, you know, they're giving him the Draymond Green on Russell Westbrook defense, and he wasn't able to make them pay at a, at a high enough volume for them to adjust differently. And and that got better over the course of the season. He caught the ball and hit them with a head of steam going downhill and was able to dump off and pass to people. He started to finish a little bit better as the year went on. So I think um, I buy those strides. By all accounts, he's a hard worker. So he says he wants to desperately continue to develop his left hand, work on his finishing, and just be able to hit like corner threes. So um, those are the things to me he has to do to be able to stay on the floor more. So I'm glad he sees that and, and hopefully the team can help him kind of um, realize that in the future. He's still young. Like I wouldn't give up this early. And during the off season, I feel like the wizards have two clear on the court needs when you're looking positionally would be mm -hmm. a floor general type yep. and just depth versatility, like another wing forward yep. type of player. What is more important for them to address this off season? I think Kuzma did like a reasonable enough job for them as sort of like the de facto three that like you can patchwork that position together, which is, is crazy because all I literally talk about on our podcast is like, this is a wings league and the wizards never have any wings. So, uh, you know, that's the most important position to me, but I think for this particular group, like just a point guard that like gets into the teeth of the defense occasionally and is not a total sieve on, you know, from a point of attack perspective would be huge. Like, Monte's really good at moving the ball around and dribbling it across half court and hit some some shots from a, a reasonable efficiency. And DeLon Wright is a ball hawk and you can't throw the ball anywhere near the guy or he will steal it from you. Like he's just sort of that good at that. But you almost need to like combine them into one player to have like a chance at this because you can't really play them together a ton of the time. And um, they each just have like such a major hole on one side of the ball. I, I think that that kills this team that you have to platoon them that way. So just somebody that maybe is a downgrade on Monte offensively and a downgrade from DeLon defensively, but is like sort of better at both would be, mm. would be helpful for this group in, in my opinion, but you can never go wrong with having just like a real true three and D wing on the roster. Cause they don't, they don't really have one like Denny's a D and Corey's the three, but they, they really don't do the other either. And I think that's sort of how this team has been assembled. This is like a lot of guys that do one thing and one thing only, and it makes them hard to play situationally a lot. Is there like a functional or stylistic change you would like to see them, whether it's address it through free agency or just change, if this is the core of the personnel that they're going to move forward with heading into next season, whether it's maybe an actual commitment to playing in transition, um, going through their half court offense a little bit faster, maybe having more ball pressure on defense, which are all things that I just stood out to me when I was watching them. Mm -hmm. Is there anything though, from you who watched them, you know, 82 times this year, whatever it was, is there something that you would like to see them change about the way they play heading? Or what's the, I'm sure there are many things Let me, where's that you'd like to change. What's the one thing that you would like to see them change or address? I think when your players are willing to come out the first, first media availability after the season is over and multiple ones mentioned that they want to play faster, there's something to that. And I, I think just looking at this roster, like, Porzingis is not like the most laterally mobile guy of all time, but he's not bad north to south, especially for a guy that big. And, and he's also a guy you can trust to be like the trailing guy that you can kick out to and, and hit a three and things like that. Gafford runs the floor pretty well. Uh, he's a pretty good lob threat and, and transition threat. Like Denny is a grab and go guy. Kyle Kuzma can be a grab and go guy. You've got Jordan Goodwin who's really good at rebounding from a guard position as a backup guard and can push the pace. So, to me, there are guys here that would sort of like facilitate them playing faster, I think. And that seems like the no-brainer one to me. There was some stuff where Wes Unseld said when he got hired that 
you know, he didn't want the team to play at a crazy high pace because he thought that negatively impacted your ability to have a set defense and play good defense. So that to me is kind of wild. I, I would agree with him if it were like 1994 still, but um, just modern teams don't seem to buy into that. Uh, and, and I think we've got to be a little bit more modern with how we try to play. I, I don't really honestly know what to do with this defense. I, I think it's more, them trying to plug holes with the roster that they have than it is like a scheme thing potentially. So um, it's just kind of whatever moves they make, you got to find a way to, to be better at point of attack and also not have to play those two bigs, but also get some weak side rim protection from whoever's next to Porzingis. So it's, it's not an easy challenge. And and you kind of asked it in the question, like there are a lot of holes you could theoretically try to fill here in the off season. And it's really just, you pick two or three of them and you hope that those make a big enough difference that the other ones aren't as glaring. Who is the player on this roster right now? Who's most likely to be traded before next season? Um, maybe not most likely to be traded, but Xavier cook seems like the most likely to not be back here to me. I would think if I'm the new GM, I, I wouldn't have seen anything from that guy that um, warrants like, you know, keeping him around longer term personally, I, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong there. Uh, I think Monte Morris would be the one I would personally advocate for. I would think a lot of teams in the playoffs right now could have a role for a guy like that as like a really good backup point guard who could even play some next year starter. And if you had the right team, like if you're, I don't know if they would ever have the money for this, but like Milwaukee or something, like I could easily envision a role for somebody like Monte on a team like that. And uh, his number's not crazy. So a team could sort of talk themselves into making that work. I think a lot of teams would be interested in Daniel Gafford, but, I don't know how you move on from him if you're the Wizards, just given one Porzingis' injury history, you have to have some kind of insurance of a guy that could at least be a spot starter. And the next big on the roster this year was Taj Gibson. So uh, you'd be basically replacing your whole center core at that point uh, if you moved on from Gafford. So to me, those would be the two that have like the most value to other teams that, that wouldn't like totally kill you, but um, you could more easily survive losing Monte to me than you could um, losing Gafford. The Wizards free agency situation is tough because I you can't really figure out which version of the mid-level exception they're going to be working with until you yeah. know how much KP and Kuzma are going to count against the book. So whether it's the mini mid-level or the bigger mid-level, are there any free agents that you've thought about that you'd like to see the Wizards go after? The free agency one is just a really interesting question because I think there's still so many other dominoes that have to fall before you can figure that out. Like, does your draft pick affect, you know, what you do from a whole perspective? perspective? If you go out and get Jairus Walker or somebody that can play next to Porzingis, is he ready to come in next year enough that maybe you don't need another mobile versatile big to play next to him. I I think in theory, I'd be going out and trying to get whatever, you know, three and D wing is on the market for the mid-level that could actually play in a playoff series. And I don't know if that even exists because it seems like all those players make $20 million a year. So right. That might be tough, but if you think Gafford is a trade chip or is a trade asset, maybe you can go out and get someone that gives you 80% of what he does, you know, more cheaply and you could move on from him. Uh, if you move on from Monte Morris, could you get another point guard that does a little bit more on both ends of the ball? Potentially those are the three positions I look at. I think you're pretty set at power forward. I think they're probably going to bring Kuzma back. I think uh, offensively Porzingis is essentially a four, right? Um, and then Denny Avdia, I think is at his best as a, as a big forward. So to me, that's one area you don't need to, to plug and, Bradley Beal, they're they're not going to do anything with him probably. So I think he's back and and I think they hope that Johnny Davis can give them some minutes as a backup two guard next year. So I think the one, three, or five is probably what you try to address and and those other dominoes kind of have to fall first before you figure out which one's the priority. Matt, you powered through a ton of tech difficulties on my end. I appreciate it. Is there anything uh, that I did not ask you about that you think needs to be discussed about this team heading into the offseason? I would just be curious for your perspective if if you, there's anything you think they're going to try to do in terms of the replacement here. Like, is there a name that makes sense? Is, is there a world where Tim Connolly goes and just destroys the Minnesota Timberwolves and then immediately moves on and starts somewhere else? My first thought was I wonder if he's gettable now just because uh, yeah. how happy is Minnesota with the job that he did. I kind of expect him, and I know the name that's been like trendy is the uh, Trajan Langdon route, and I feel mm-hmm. like – they will go along similar lines where it will be someone who's 
less proven as the head of a front office. Mm. Um, and that's what they'll wind up with. I think I'll be shocked. I'm sure every team inquires about Masai Ujiri. Um, right. I'm sure though. And he's been linked to Washington in the past, of course. Yeah. I think that's why it might matter here. I would be fairly surprised if it ends up being a big name yeah. that you actually want. And if it's a big <laughs> name, it's probably one where it's like, Oh, today is like, is, is Ernie back? Yeah, like, D- Danny Ferry. Here we go. We're finally making it happen. Right. So I, I think that's the route they'll go, but the, they, there really haven't been that I've seen a ton of Nate. I saw Langdon and I think Ujiri's just always out there. And then Connolly has tangentially been mentioned because of like his history with Washington in the past. But I haven't seen like a ton of names mentioned as potential replacements for Shepard. Langdon was interesting because they didn't interview him the last time around, despite his name getting brought up a good amount, but he's also had, you know, four more years of seasoning as a younger guy to try to build his resume. I'm blanking on the gentleman's name that's sort of um, on, directly under Masai Ujiri, but uh, maybe... Oh, uh, Bobby Webster. Yeah, maybe I give him a call just to see what's up with him if he wants a little more freedom and wants to get out from under Masai's shadow a little bit. Um, I, I like a lot of the things Toronto has done, so uh, the things they have are the things Washington doesn't as like long athletic wings for the most part, so maybe he's a guy who could come in here and, and find them a couple of those, so... Uh, I, that's somewhere I'd look. The name I dropped on our pod was Tayshawn Prince, just because I've heard he's oh, yeah. been really instrumental um, behind the scenes with Memphis and, and a lot of the talent evaluation there that's gone well for them. So, you know, maybe he's ready for a bigger role. I don't know if, you know, main GM is the role that they're willing to give him right out of the gate here, but um, that that's kind of names I would, I would kick around at least. I will say this is not, and it's sort of just like when you're firing a head coach, this is not a decision you should make unless you have a top replacement in mind and at least a semi-strong grasp of, is this person gettable? It's that you you don't fire Tommy Shepard because you want to see if you can poach Masai Ujiri from Toronto. That's not, that's not a decision you make. Yeah, exactly. Like they fired Ernie. I think they pretty much knew that they, at the very least they had Tommy in their back pocket as a, as a defendable candidate at the time. And, this one, yeah, to your point, I, I don't know who that candidate would be. Uh, so the, the, I don't know if some search firm had reached out on their behalf in advance here, but um, maybe maybe there's something going on behind the scenes. It should be resolved soon because they do have the draft uh, coming up in a couple yeah. months. So you would, would like to have someone installed, not just by the draft, but so mm-hmm. that they have the time to like begin their own processes. And like, so I would expect a resolution somewhat soon, but mm-hmm. you, yeah, you would hope. Uh, Matt, are you able to tell our listeners where they can follow you and all the uh, fantastic work that you do? Sure. If you're just a bizarre human and you're listening to this and you clearly like good podcasts, if you want to listen to one about the Wizards, which unless you're a Wizards fan, I'm not sure why you would, but it's Believe in Wizards, B-L-E-A-V in Wizards. I do it with former wizard Jihadi White, and uh, we just talk through uh, all the news of the day, try to get player perspective and things like that. So uh, if that appeals to you, Come on in. Um, you know, we're, we're going to do some draft stuff this offseason, and that'll be kind of more uh, general NBA than it is sort of team specific. So uh, that'll be interesting for for other folks. And uh, Bullets Forever, if you want to go check us out there, it's an SB Nation blog. That's where I do some of my writing and all the, all the other good Wizards content that's out there, too. Uh, I will echo everything that Matt said and also the Believe in Wizards podcast. Very honest analysis, which I appreciate. Uh, and don't sell yourself short. Regionalized coverage is so good now when I'm talking about like single team podcasts and uh, you over there are among the very best. Enjoy listening to you guys whenever I'm checking in on the Wizards. Everyone else should do the same. I'm sure you know by now that I will be pestering you again in the future. Maybe the Wizards will look a lot different when I do. Who knows? My fingers are crossed. Um, but yes, thank you so much for coming on. I'll talk to you soon, Matt. Thanks, Dave.